want to introduce Dr. Winwin Lee from Arizona State University. And Winwin and I met at the at the AGU and a couple of other polar science meetings probably in the last 18 months or so. And uh, we started talking about this. And, and Winwin is is really involved in a very interesting project to to actually develop further the capabilities of polar cyber infrastructure by allowing uh, searching through metadata from a number of different archives, of which a CADIS is one. Uh, and, to, uh, and, and I invited her here to share that with us. And then over the next couple of days, she'll be meeting with the ACADIS team to talk about the areas of collaboration and, uh, and opportunities to move forward uh, together. Win-win comes to us from the, uh, as you can see here, from a rather complicated thing. I'm going to just say the School of Geographic, uh, Ge Geographical Sciences and Urban Planning, as well as Geo, what is it? Geoda? Geoda Center. Geoda Center for Geospatial Analysis uh, and Computation at Arizona State University. She began her uh, education in, in Beijing, Ch China, and then came here to the U.S. through George Mason University, then to, um, and then now finally at, at Arizona State. So we, we welcome you, Dr. Lee, and please uh, please talk to us. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, for the nice introduction. <laughs> good, good morning, everyone. Um, as Jim has introduced, uh, my name is Wen Wen Lee. I'm now assistant professor at Arizona State University. Um, it's my great honor to have the opportunity to present my work here. And I also hope that through the two days visit here and communication with the colleagues at UCAR, we can identify some areas of uh, interest so we can collaborate closely in the near future. And I also very welcome any feedback um, from you about my work uh, in building a polar cyber infrastructure. So in my today's talk, actually the content I will cover will be more than uh, semantic search. So I will start to introduce the research progress I have made um, from a uh, Oh, this makes me feel so much better. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I can turn off all the lights and see any folks, you know? <laughs> yeah. I will first uh, introduce the research progress uh, I have done through the, uh, funded by a National Science Foundation on um, developing a large scale data crawler to find the distributed polar data resources to support polar science. And uh, then I will introduce the semantic search work that I think uh, many data centers uh, will find it um, maybe helpful because in our, our data centers, we have a large collection of data sets, right? And how to build a link from this data set to a scientist to help them to <coughs> find the most needed data. So that is uh, where semantic search comes into play. And this area is the area I have been working on for the past few years. And at last, I will introduce the working progress of building a polar cyber infrastructure portal that um, integrates all these distributed data resources that has been funded through the crawler and also integrate different modules like semantic search and to um, support the scientific analysis of polar data. And before I get into the technical details, let's take a look at this picture. So we see uh, this giant big a uh, lovely animal from the polar region that makes me want to go to the Arctic to see them in person. However, very unfortunately, their habitat and the living environment has been greatly affected by the global warming and the climate change, making them one of the most endangered species in the world. So we want to do something to protect these lovely animals. It's just like protecting our own living environment. And preserve the Biodiversity in the polar region is only one of the many reasons we want to study and pay more attention to the polar, polar regions. And I have listed a few reasons. So first, there are uh, increasing interest in the mining and exploration of the natural resources like gas in the Arctic region. Also, the polar regions are the key drivers for the Earth's climate. And they are very sensitive to the human activities and the global environmental and the climate change. So we want to do something and to preserve the, our planet as a whole, especially the Arctic region. And uh, in the recent President's National Strategy for the Arctic region that released uh, last May, they have um, 
designed these overarching stewardship objectives, which is to make the decisions using the best available information. So making the best available, making decisions with the best available information means three things to me. So first, we want to improve the accessibility of these distributed data resources. And then it's the discoverability. And the third one is the integratability. So by in accessibility, I mean given the fact that the polar data set are widely dispersed on the internet, so how can we collect these dispersed uh, resources in order to improve that accessibility? So we want to collect them and put them into a big central repository to support the scientists to find this data. So once we found and uh, put this data, all the dispersed data into a central place, so the next one is the how to improve the discoverability of this data. And uh, this solves a problem like, once we have a large set of the data, and how we can find the scientists to find the most needed data that will have their modeling and the scientific analysis the best. So that is where the semantic search and other intelligent search uh, part um, <coughs> that I'm trying to address this issue. And the third one is integrat integratability. So by this, I mean, how can we, all these polar data, they are heterogeneous in nature, right? So we have the net CDF format, we have the GLT data, we have the history shape file data, and they are all in terms in different format. So how can we integrate this heterogeneous data set and convert, from, convert this data into useful information? And that is the integratability issue that um, I'm trying to solve. So here is just a brief um, introduction about uh, my project in terms of building a service-oriented polar CI portal funded through NSF. And we originally have proposed uh, four objectives. And the two of them uh, were funded. So the first one is to establish a large-scale web crawler to improve the accessibility of big polar data. So that is uh, the first uh, topic ever introduced. And uh, the also another, the other funded objective is to improve the data service quality. Because once we get a data service, we want to give the scientists an idea of how good the quality is to help them um, better select the data and to improve the portal usability. And uh, I've been working on this uh, for the past like nine months. And my collaborator, Phil Young from GMU, he's working on the third objective. So this is the outline of my today's talk. First, I will introduce a tool called Polar Hub. So by calling this name, I mean it is a hub of polar data that is to use a large scale um, web crawling strategy to find the distributed polar data. And this is to address the accessibility issue. The second one is um, I want to briefly introduce the semantic research I have been working on. And uh, I will introduce the two approach. So one is the ontology based uh, semantic reasoning. And uh, it's like an ontology, in my understanding, is building a knowledge base like our human has, but making it machine understandable and processable. And by integrating with some reasoning capabilities, we can um, help the, once a query has been sent to a search tool, it can automatically navigate the scientists to expand their query in order to find the most needed data. So this is kind of a top-down approach because the intelligent search actually heavily dependent on how the ontology is being, being built up. And the second approach I use is a kind of a bottom-up approach, approach. Instead of relying on a predefined knowledge base, we will learn the data semantics from the data itself using some um, machine learning techniques to support the intelligent search. And I will introduce briefly of how these two approach um, will be working. And uh, this is to solve the discoverability issue. And the last one, I will briefly introduce and demo you um, a recent CI portal that, ha that I have developed, which is aims at sharing, integrating, visualizing, and analyzing the polar data. And this is to solve the integratability um, issue. So. Uh, let's see how the Polar Hub works in order to improve the accessibility of the polar data. 
And I have a list of reference here, which um, I had uh, worked on a couple of years ago. To improve the accessibility, there are several challenges. First of all, the polar data set, and in a broader sense, the Earth observation data set are uh, of huge amount. So for example, the NASA's Earth observation data information system has has supported the daily production of several terabytes of Earth observation data every day. So we have a large chunk of the data available to us. And uh, these data are widely dispersed in different data centers. For example, NASA has different DEC data centers like PODEC and CDEC. And for the polar data, we have ACADIS, we have NSIDC, we have AOS and the other uh, data centers. And uh, in terms of cataloging this data, the current approach is to use the OGC, the Open Geospatial Consortium supported catalog service. But we have done um, an experiment on the geospatial one stop, which is now the data.gov. So there are about 15K <coughs> layers from 600 web map services um, registered in that catalog. But by the time we did the experiment, only 80 of them are live. So almost 90% of them are dead links. And the fourth challenge we, we are facing now is these data are of various different formats and they are uh, coming from the different stakeholders. So it's different to make them interoperable with each other. And in terms of addressing this issue, the current solution is to uh, rely on the OGC, Open Geospatial Consortium Catalog Service for the Web, the CSW catalog. So the way it works is a service provider, a data provider, will register their data into the catalog. And then by providing the essential metadata describing their data and the services. And then in the front end of the catalog, there is a tool to support the discovery and browse and query the data and other resources. So this is how we can enable the um, data discovery using the catalog approach. However, there are several disadvantages. So first of all, it is based on the massive mode. For example, the service provider must register their services into the catalog in order to make it discoverable. If a, a service provider didn't register it, it could not be found, right? And uh, the second disadvantage is it is lack, lack of update. So this service registration is kind of one-time thing. And after a while, if the service endpoint changes or it becomes unavailable, there is no mechanism for the catalog to catch these changes. That's why a lot of the dead links occurred in this kind of catalog. To address this issue, I propose the Polar Hub solution, which is to use the active large-scale web mining to find the distributed polar data resources. And I propose the two strategies. So one is called Meta Crawler. The second one is called the Geo Bridge for Meta Catalog. So I called I use two meta here. Um, maybe you guys are not, but some of you who are not familiar with crawler, so it works as it starts from some of the web pages and then it gets all the hyperlinks from that web page and then it c started to expand, get on the web page of all those hyperlinks inside the web page and keep crawling until the whole web, the entire web will be crawled. So this is how the crawler works. And I call it a meta crawler because I didn't design a crawler that's trying to crawl and find over 20 billions of web pages because this is very time consuming and Google and other big search engine companies, they have already done a good job. So the meta crawler is actually built upon the Google search and then we did the crawler from there. So the Google search is what it did is it helped us to do a first filter and get us some of the websites that is closely linked to the possible polar data resources. And then we started the crawling from there. So that is why I call it a meta crawler. And the second approach is called a geo bridge to um, <coughs> build a meta catalog because we have this distributed catalog. So after finding them, I will build a bridge to connect to each of the distributed catalog <coughs> and harvest all the data services registered in those catalog. So instead of direct 
discovery of the data services on the web. I also trying to find all the distributed catalogs, which is, means all the distributed database, and then grab all the data service registered in those database to our central repository. So in this way, a lot of the data that had distributed could be found. <coughs> so this is just a picture. So I will use this linked data approach to see these are the linked web pages. So almost all of the web page, over 20 billion the web page are interlinked with each other. And these red circles are the data services the crawler is trying to find. And we are trying to find a different type of the services, like using uh, red and green color to, to uh, differentiate that. And then these uh, yellow ones are actually the database, which are the distributed online catalogs we are also trying to identify. So here is the architecture for the crawler. So first I will start from some crawling entry. So again, the crawling entry is not um, an arbitrary entry, but we did a first filter through the Google search. So that can make us get immediately closer to the data set we are trying to find. And then we extract all the source page of that web page, put it into a buffer. And then the source page analyzer is trying to extract all the hyperlinks existed on the web page. And, and the first filter is trying to filter out the services, out <coughs> the URLs that would have no possibility to link to a data service, like an image file. So then after filter that, the URLs, the web pages that have a very big possibility to linked to a data service will be put in the crawler queue, and then it will be continuous working on until um, all the possible web pages has been crawled. And the second branch is for any web page I found, I will try to see whether it is a data service. If it is, then I will directly put it into the data repository. If otherwise, if it is a catalog, and then I will do use the GL bridge to harvest the data services within this web catalog, and then register the data service into the, um, the virtual repository. So this is how the crawler um, can find as many services as we, we want. And in terms of the GL bridge, this is how it works, because um, OGC has defined the catalog service for the web standards. So they only gave the standards for how a, a user should send the request. So what are the perimeter patterns? But it didn't define how a CSW should, uh, what kind of metadata they should use to respond to this request. So what I did is, um, so this CSW service could respond using FGDC data, metadata. They could use Dublin Core metadata. They could also use the ISO metadata. So in this GL bridge, once I detect the metadata standard used by different catalogs, I will immediately plug an interpreter, a metadata parser, into communicating with the remote catalog in order to harvest all the data service into the catalog. So, so this is um, how the um, GL bridge works. And this is just a, um, just a view of the spatial density and the distribution of the current data services we have found for over three, um, 35,000 of data sets coming from almost uh, a thousand um, web services. We see several hotspots, right? So DC area is certainly a hotspot because there are a lot of government agencies and they are very active in improving the interoperability um, of <coughs> the data resources. And another hotspot is at uh, Florida. So there are um, a military laboratory there. So they uh, they are hosting a number of the data services. And the third hotspot is in the uh, Netherlands. And in terms of the distribution of data set in a certain theme, like I used the snow and ice as a keywords. So now the distribution pattern changes. We see a certain hotspot here, which is in Denver. And, and uh, the NSIDC has provided many different uh, data services to support uh, the snow and ice research. And uh, also here for the, the military labor laboratory, there's also a hotspot here. We see that this is no longer a hotspot providing the data set related to um, snow and ice. Yes? So it looked like there was almost nothing over in Asia. Oh, 
um, yes, by that time, when I made the figure, we haven't found um, some data services here. But um, in a minute, when I show you the, the current crawling process, we will see some of them coming up here, and also in Australia and other uh, South America. Okay, so let me show you a demo to see. In that demo, you will see more of the services coming out. So by the time um, this has been done, we haven't uh, found that many services. We have currently uh, have a prototype up and running. So if you are interested, I will show you the link that you can get on. And this is uh, just a movie. Oops, sorry. OK, so this is the Polar Hub website. Um, you can see there are uh, three parts. The first part is a task that you can create the different search. Um, I think the resolution is not very good here. So uh, this one is, the, uh, if I put NASA WMS, then I'm trying to find um, all the web map service uh, provided by NASA. And uh, here is um, what kind of the data types I'm trying to find. And if there's any service data service found, I will illustrate it into this web panel. And then uh, this is the meta crawler, how the meta crawler works. On this tab, the miscellaneous crawler, I'm trying to connect it to some known data centers, including Acadus and NSIDC. So if I click one of the tasks, you see, you will see that, oops. So if I click one of the tasks, you will see in the map that all the services has been found at those different locations. Now you see some coming up um, like in Asia and, uh, and Australia, and also some of them, a lot of them in the uh, US region, and uh, also a lot of them uh, in the Europe. Can you get the location by IP address? Uh, yes. So actually, let me try to show you the the portal here. So if you go to polar.geodacenter.org slash polar hub, you will get onto this page. Um, as a regular user, you don't have all the um, permissions, but uh, I can show, I can uh, give you the authorization to work. Okay, so I have login used my account. That means I have access to all of the services. So you see, these are the, the task list. And then if I click one of the tasks, for example, um, we have coverage service. These are the, the, the services I found. And then if I click Alaska WMS, so there are um, a few of the services I found. So if I choose the real time, real-time statistics, I know that there are 290 services found through this uh, crawling task. And uh, if you click one of the balloons, you will see all the services that are linked to this <coughs> specific location. And uh, below, there's uh, all the service links that uh, we found by the crawler. If you double click, you can, it will link to you to the capability file that if you download, you are going to view the metadata file from there. And then you can also um, click show our crowd. So these are the current services we found. We actually have found over 3,000. And this one is just a prototype that we released uh, to the user. So we see that there are almost uh, 800 services we have been found. These are the different types of services, like uh, web map service, web feature service, web processing service, and the CSW, which is the catalog service. So you see there's a distribution map of this, and then in, in below, we see that the locations and the number of the services. So let's see which one provide. Oh, the USGS provide the most web services. Okay, so then if you uncheck one of the type, 
So you will see the distribution pattern changes for um, other types of services. So I can just unlink all of the others. Now these services are found um, as one type of service, which is um, the web processing service. And you can also um, filter out like based on the task. So if I click here, and then I will see how many services are found by um, the task ID one. And I can actually start a real time a new job. So for example, if I create a new job, I give a keyword USGS. Um, WMS. So hopefully I can find uh, the depth means how much further I want to uh, let like the crawler go to crawl the web. So if I put it a small number, that means I can I may be able to quickly identify a service. If I put it a larger number, that means I have a chance to find many services I can find. So I will check all different type of the services, and then I will click crawl Google. So then I will save the task. So if I start from here, and then I can click start. So it actually st start the crowding. I thought Google was your starting point. Um, yes. Why are you saying crawl Google and Bing? Oh, yes, uh, Google is. Google and Bing are all our the starting point I'm trying to crawl. Currently, um, Google is the, the primary website that I, I try to search from. So if you see, the this is a real-time crawling. These are showing the web pages that I'm currently um, crawling. Okay. And these are cached, or these are responses from Google? Um, these are the actually the, hold on one second, let me, Refresh because the map didn't refresh, so let me reload it again, and then I click a task, and then I from the real time crawling it will shows how many like which are the web page I'm going to crawl, and from real time statistics it will show me once some services has been found it will show me um, on real time on the map and also um, on this on this chart. Uh, could you ask the question again? Uh, I'm confused. Just go on. Oh, okay. So, um, <coughs> what we did for the crawling test is, we, after user gave this uh, request, I will first send it to Google, and then I grab the links, the, like the the top ten pages of the results from Google, and then I start to search from there. So I'm not uh, just uh, starting from any web page that contain uh, USGS and WMS. It actually is a web page that is recommended by um, by Google that has uh, more of the information or possibility to contain these two keywords. And then the crawling test it starts from there. So are you filtering on polar keywords here at all, snow mass keywords, or is this just everything? Okay. Um, Right now, this is uh, this is everything, okay. and uh, through uh, a filter of the from the main data, like I can filter based on the extent of the data set, mm -hmm. and then I will be able to get all the data set that covering the polar region, which is 70 degree north and. Uh, so I'm not sure why I haven't found any services yet. <coughs> so let me try to create another one, and uh, let's uh, make it crawling for a while. So let me see, use another keyword. So I'm trying to find all this. Oh, cool. It start to have finding some, if you see it from here. And uh, this number is keep increasing. So if you see that, um, this number is keep increasing on the map. And uh, so this nine number is keep increasing, and now we find more services at different locations. So this number has been ch changes, and uh, this chart will be updated in real time as well. And uh, this table will also be updated as more services has been found. So if you see here, more services found in this region. So you, you can see an uh, increasing number of the services has been um, identified here. And if I click, so this site is keep increasing. 
This is from the U.S. Marine website from USGS. And uh, this is a place from uh, Iowa State. Okay, cool. So this number is keeping increasing. We can wait for a while uh, and uh, see like how many service data services has been found by this particular crowning task. Okay, so then let's move on. If you are interested, you can get onto this webpage, uh, polar.geodacenter.org uh, slash polar hub, and uh, it will ask you to uh, sign up as a username, and then you can access some of the uh, some of the functionalities, but not all. If you are interested in getting all of the functionalities, uh, you can send me an email, and I will give you the uh, authorization. So here are the features of Polar Hub that we have the ability to very quickly identify the um, polar data resources. And it also provides a real-time visualization of this data um, and as well as their distributions. So we showed it on the map of how many services we found and uh, how they are distributed. And uh, um, hopefully this tool can be potentially used by different government agencies to um, evaluate or assess their interoperability process. So as a next step, uh, we will deploy the crawler on a distributed system to make it um, to make it a very powerful tool because right now we didn't release all the functionalities to the public because our server probably cannot afford too many. Uh, re um, this is uh, like the next the next direction I'm trying to work on is to identify the best set of data sets in order to find the, all of the data services related to polar region. So right now I'm trying to find any geospatial web services uh, that is existed on the web. So we need to further filter down it to uh, polar region specifically. So that is the um, next immediate task that I'm going to do. Are yes. Oh, uh, because currently, um, as you see, when I create a task, I put some keywords, right? So a user creates some keywords. He's trying to find the, some services related to that keyword. But as a polar hub, like I want to collect as many services as we can. So I want to identify through the current uh, found services, what are the best keywords we should use in order to um, expand the search to find any uh, possible occurrences of the geospatial data resources, not only from um, just the user, like they actually type in some of the interest um, keywords, then they started to try, started to find some services. So um, we, our goal is to find as many as services, if not all, as many as services as we found. That is what I mean by machine learning. And uh, this Polar Hub addressed the accessibility issue of the polar data resources. So next topic, I will move on how to enable the semantic search in order to build a linkage between the scientists and the data services we found through Polar Hub. So I will propose to use a hybrid approach. As I introduced earlier, so it's a combination of a top-down ontology-based approach and a bottom-up data mining-based approach to support in the intelligent search. So the ontologies, um, my understanding of the ontologies is just like uh, duplication of human knowledge in the brain and make it machine processable. But actually it's a simplified and subset version of our, our knowledge. And in the ontology, it has defined the different geospatial concepts as well as their properties and interconnections between these different concepts. And ontology plays an important role in establishing the theoretical foundations for uh, GI science. And I, I believe it would will also help to improve the data science as a whole. Um, the ont ontology-based semantic search work I'm currently using um, is based on Suite 2.0. So Suite is a, sh a synchronous for semantic web for the Earth and the environmental terminologies. And this is a Suite 2.0, which is 
uh, more have a modularized design, and our polar science could be in the third layer, which is the Earth system science layer. And besides SWEET, there are also many other existence of the ontologies. For example, the EU have their spatial data infrastructure in SPARE ontology, and uh, NASA also has a global climate change master directory, uh, the science keywords. And the DBpedia is a gazetteer ontology, which is used to disambiguate the place names. And also Kawashi is a hydrology ontology, and MMI is a machine, uh, onto uh, marine ontology. And here is a conceptual framework. I propose uh, to build a domain ontology. So first, the earth science domain can be divided into different subdomains. For example, hydrology, atmosphere, cryosphere. And then for each of the domain, it can be subdivided into different facets. For example, um, phenomena, substance, process, earth realm, time, and <coughs> property. And uh, as an example, like precipitation is an instance of phenomena, right? And the snow and ice are substance. And uh, the melting of snow and the sea ice are a process. And it occurs in the Arctic region, which is related to Earth's realm. So this is the facet space. And then going down one more layer, this is the object and the relationship <coughs> space. That is where the different spatial concepts are interconnected with each other. And then going down to the bottom layer, this is the attribute space, where we use a different attribute to describe a certain feature. For example, in the river, the flow rate could be stagnant, or it could be flowing, or the temperature could be uh, low, medium, or high. So this is the attribute space. And here is an example of the polar data ontology. For example, the water can be existed in, in terms of uh, data the different state, right? And the ice and the snow is a type of solid water. And ice could be measured by ice concentration and the melting rate. And the snow can be measured by snow depths and the snow cover. So if give me a question, so how to use the logical reasoning to go through this ontology to find um, the needed data set for the scientist? And uh, for example, if I try to ask, how does the solid water melt influence the stream flow in the Arctic region over summertime? So th there are several steps. First, we want to do the syntax analysis. So we want to decompose this query into different parts. So we know that solid water is a subject we are going to learn, and the place that occurs is the Arctic. And then what is the process and what is the time? So after the syntax analysis, we go to the semantic analysis. Basically, we are trying to expand the, the query into different subqueries. For example, solid water, we know snow and ice are all solid water. So these queries are just trying to expand this search to help us to find more relevant or more specialized data set. And then the next one is we want to translate those semantic <coughs> queries into the formal query. Um, this is kind of sparkle query. And send the request to a machine and to do the semantic query. So basically, this is a kind of advanced version of SQL query that can help us to identify the relationships within an ontology. And here is an example of how to link between this ontology into the data set that existed in the different um, data centers. So I know that by the semantic uh, query, I know that snow is, a, temp is a, a type of solid water, and it can be measured by a snow cover. And then um, the snow cover has related earth realm of water body. And I know that river is a type of stream, and the stream is a type of water body. And then in this metadata definition, I find the river is a kind of keywords. So now I make a linkage between solid water and uh, the river keywords in the metadata. And then I can eventually, through the online link, to find the data set that can help me with the research. And similarly, if I want the snow depth data, I can uh, find it from the NSIDC's um, database. So here is another demo that um, a 
semantic search tool I have developed before. So this is actually um, is an example of using this kind of ontology to support um, the air quality um, research. So if you get onto the semantic search part, then you can start here to search uh, some kind of the keywords like um, air quality, and then this trying to connect to the different online catalogs. So through here is what I'm trying to demo you. Um, we have integrated this kind of semantic search into the Arctic. Um, so if you click one of the link, you know that this um, physical substance is related to the particulate, and then you can keep uh, going on to navigate through the ontology in order to find, okay, so dust is a particulate, and it is related to um, air quality, and then you can uncheck some of the um, catalogs, and then to find some of the service that we can do the realization to see how the different parameters like PM 2.5 and how they influence the air quality in a certain region. So this is how to use the ontology navigation and the semantic reasoning in order to link between a query air quality, which is very general, to a specific data set that we are trying to model. And there are several challenges of the ontology-based approach. So first of all, it is very hard for an ontology to model the spatial relationship. For example, we have a sensor network, and we have many sensors. If we are trying to ask how many sensors is within a certain region, then we will, in the ontology, we probably need to build a relationship of this sensor within a certain region, and then if we have thousands of sensors, then we need to build thousands of relationship in the ontology, which is very um, time consuming. And we need some of the ability to do this spatial reasoning on the fly. And then um, also the ontology-based approach, a big challenge is it's very hard for us to build a consensus domain ontology because different people will have different perspective of how an ontology could be built. And also, it has, in current the semantic reasoning tools, it has limited spatial reasoning capability, which we usually ask. So to address this issue, I propose a, a data mining approach, which to use the data and the semantic analysis technique. So in order, um, instead of relying on the relationship defined in the ontology, I try to identify the latent semantic relationships automatically through the semantic analysis and the data mining process. And actually, this is um, use uh, mathematical modeling and linear algebra to do the task. But um, I will show you an example. If you are interested, you can um, uh, get onto this paper and uh, to find more information related to it. Actually, the latent semantic association um, works at, it assumes that the co-occurred keywords will have more uh, relevance in, uh, in the knowledge, okay? So for example, we have three metadata, and these two metadata have um, Arctic and uh, permafrost co-occurred a lot, and then this one has Arctic and frozen ground co-occurred, because they have the same, um, they have the same keywords in the two documents, although permanent and permafrost and the frozen ground didn't co-occur um, in the same document. But through the latent semantic analysis, we can build the linkage between them. So similar thing, because in this one, we all have the permafrost in the two uh, documents, and then we can automatically build the linkage between Arctic and the polar, and how closely these term are related is dependent on um, how many co co how many co-occurrences of this uh, concept in the whole database. So this is the idea of how I can identify the latent associations between the different terms, which are not built in the ontology. Um, I don't think I have time to give a 
live demo here. So I just uh, go through that quickly. Like here are a number of the queries I identified to compare how the semantic search works better than um, a general full type based search. So I select a few queries. So for example, this one is trying to find all the frozen ground in Canada, and this one is trying to find the earthquake magnitude data in the Arctic. And uh, maybe I can do very quickly. So here is, uh, this one is a uh, geo network. So does anyone of you know geo network? So this is an open source catalog that can support the CSW search. So they provide a full type based search of you can ingest all the metadata into this catalog and then you can search from there. So by not using the semantic search technique that I integrated into this portal, we can search for the frozen ground in Canada. So what we found is um, we were not able to find any uh, relevant keywords. But if we enable the semantic search, so we will see that there are several um, there are several data sets that could be found. Uh, for example, um, for example, uh, this one that's called Canadian former frost sickness. Like in my um, in my search keyword, there's no occurrences of former frost. But because the latent semantic analysis, I will be able to build the semantic relations between former frost and the frozen ground. And then this record can be identified as a relevant record. And uh, here are some experiments. So in terms of measure how good a search tool is, there are two factors. One is a recall rate, one is a precision rate. Recall rate is given a data set, given a database, how many relevant data sets you can find. Like, um, then this is a comparison between uh, my method. These are just the different strategies using um, purple color is my strategy. And uh, Lucene is a very popular full text based search. We see that in terms of finding relevant data set, um, this approach by expanding the latent semantics is much better than uh, the Lucene search, which are very popularly used by many of the um, search tools. And then in terms of precision, precision means given all the data sets you found, how many of them are relevant? So we see, although our approach, the purple columns, uh, some of them are not as good as the Lucene search because we expand the latent semantic uh, associations. Some of them are relevant, but may not be direct relevant. So we see uh, like a less, a not as good um, precision rate as Lucene. But I'm trying to improve this precision site in order to make it more uh, efficient. So as a big picture for the semantic search, first, I think a hybrid approach is needed. We first need a higher level domain ontology to define the skeleton and the structure of the knowledge. So this could be the contribution from the domain expert. And we also need to use the data mining and knowledge mining to find the latent semantics um, automatically in order to build and enrich the content in the ontology in order to make the semantic search more um, intelligent. So. And uh, I guess uh, this could be the two topic I will give today. And if you are interested, later I can introduce you how the Polar CI portal works and how this uh, data crawler and the semantic search are being integrated in the Polar portal for the analysis. Uh, let me see. OK, so until now we have found uh, many more services than uh, then like when we started to search. Okay, so thank you guys if you have any questions. Let's see, we have time for a few questions. Are there questions from the group? Oh, so yes. are there plans to incorporate feedback from the people doing the searching? Like if you knew 
researchers and their background, and you can tell someone with a similar background, here's the links that you know somebody else found relevant. Yeah, um, I think I think we we should develop such capability that allow um, user feedback and uh, to identify the potential linkage between um, a scientist that has a certain uh, knowledge and background to uh, the most needed data, data set. But right now, all of this work I have been doing is machine-based, so I haven't involved uh, much of the feedback from the user group yet. But this is a very good comment. Thank you. Yes? Uh, just a clarification. So uh, when you're identifying these services, how do you, how, how, how do you identify that something is a service? It, was it through the metadata feeds that were available to discuss in the diagram? Okay. Um, so for this different type of service, so OGC has a, a standard interface. So I know that if I send a certain request, if they get uh, give me the response as uh, some template, then I can identify it as a one type of the service. So I, uh, this crawler currently cannot identify any type of polar data. Polar data. So what we can identify is those uh, data services um, com compliant with the OGC standards. questions? In, in, yes. in terms of your ontological representation, is that uh, all uh, developed within your shop or are you using tools like Palantir or things like that for, for that sort of, that aspect of it? Mm, like the, the one that has been used uh, in the semantic search tool, that is uh, developed by the domain expert. And also I have contributed some of them. No, no, I, I don't mean the, the content of the ontology itself, but I mean the underlying structure of the tools that you're using to represent it. Oh, okay. You mean the structure of the ontology? The structure of the ontology is uh, defined by um, a scientist called uh, um, named Robert R Ruskin. So that is based on Suite 2.0. So we populate the content based on the Suite standard. And in terms of the tool, we use Protigy to develop the actual ontology. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, so uh, because uh, my earlier work is related to OGC service, and when I built up this crawler, I found that um, using OGC is uh, something that I feel most uh, comfortable with. So as the framework is being to build up, I'm going to expand like the type that we are going to search. But the search strategy will be similar. But in terms of the different data type, we need that specific filter in order to determine whether that is uh, related to a certain data type. Other questions? When, when, how, how successful were you, how well did ACADIS uh, represent itself in, in, the, in the work that you're uh, doing oh. here? Right. Sorry, I forgot to uh, demonstrate that. So in the miscellaneous crawler, so we see that I have already linked it to um, the two data centers. One is Arcadius, one is NSIDC. So if you click, um, okay, click one of the links, then we see that this is the extent of all the Arcadius metadata has been covered. Um, and if you scroll down, we, we can see the oh, almost 3,000 of the metadata from Arcadius has been harvested into our portal. And uh, if you click one of, the, one of the links, you will see the extent for this uh, metadata and uh, this information extracted from um, this metadata definition. Actually, in the Arcadius website, uh, this is something I would like to discuss with the colleagues here. In the Arcadius website, um, it's a template-based metadata. So what we uh, did is we converted it to an FGDC format by incorporating as many information from the Arcadius website as, uh, as possible. But we're we not sure whether this is the correct way to harvest the metadata from Arcadius. And for NSIDC, uh, this also shows all the coverage for the NSIDC data set. So we currently find um, about 900 of the main data from NSIDC. You can also, oops, uh, you can also click, I think that may have some
problem if you can click this. This metadata is directly download from NSADC. So you can see how the um, the linkage is being built to the Akitas and the NSADC from this data crawler. So Chip, were you actually asking what fraction of the Akitas data set can be found? Yeah, exactly. And so the number she had was 20, almost 3,000, is that right? Yeah, almost 3,000. close to uh huh. Okay. Yep. Yep. Uh, I mean, I mean, one of the <coughs> one of the design one of the design criteria for this was to make sure that these things, you know, we use standards for metadata, and as our colleague Steve Williams would say, the beauty of standards is there's so many to choose from, right? So you have to figure out some sort of a common some sort of a common base from which to work, and and so quite independently, you know, we confirm the. Uh, the strength of our technique th through what uh, through what Dr. Lee has done here. Other questions? All right. Well, let's. Oh, sorry, Don. Yes, please. When you're crawling for services, do you ever worry about finding services that still exist out there but have been deprecated? They're, they're still live, but they're not necessarily current. Do you ever run into that or think about it? They are still live and they are not current. So, um, so I assume that if a, a live service will, you mean current means this is not data related to the current time frame? No, just that it, it might be the case that a center has stood up a set of services and then um, removed the, the direct links to them and stood up a new set of services that they're maintaining more currently. Oh, that I are see. more advanced. And I so see. the old ones are still, I mean, you, you see that a lot on the web. There's, there's stuff that's still out there and you can still find it. Right, but right, right. It's, uh, you know, that happened with our bus schedule here for the ones. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I think this is, a, <laughs> this is a very good uh, comment. Right now, like, I'm just uh, trying to search all the services. Yeah. So I cannot distinguish between those that have not been maintained now and uh, what is uh, actively ma being maintained currently. Yeah. So um, I will think about a way to, to get that done. Yes, please. Do you do your semantic search across other semantic repositories? Or are you only using your repository to do research? Okay. Um, I'm currently only use the uh, semantics from um, my repository. So actually, I have built a test bed, the semantic test bed that allow uh, the different scientists to populate the ontologies into um, into our backend repository. But a question uh, we are facing is. We need to make sure before we make it public and use it into our semantic search tool, we need to make sure that those concepts has been populated are accurate or uh, precise. So uh, because of that, we, we still use like a safe version of the ontology. So we'll stop here. The, um, Dr. Lee will be around here for uh, this afternoon with EOL tomorrow morning at NSIDC and tomorrow afternoon at uh, at Sizzle up on the Mesa Lab. So if you have other questions, you can get those to me or one of your colleagues in any of these organizations. We'll make sure we get those questions to, uh, to Dr. Lee. Again, let's thank her for uh, <laughs>